Hi, here we are. Um, okay. We just introduced ourselves, so you know who we are. Um, this is uh, kind of how we're going to go about this is we're going to spend the first few minutes talking about a chapter of the primal wound, and then we're going to each episode interview somebody. Yep. <laughs> Our first episode is going to be about Sarah, actually, who's, uh, who's adopted. And I'm Louise, and I'm adopted, obviously. And we'll do myself in the second episode. And then we're going to have a variety of guests of all kinds to tackle everything about adoption. Yeah, kind of all angles. Um, just everyone's experience with this. Everyone's had different experiences, but there seems to be a similar core theme amongst us all, um, which leads to what we'll discuss right now. Um, the first episode of the, of the first episode, I'm sorry, the first chapter of the primal wound, um, which I only found, we only found, mm -hmm. I mean, within the year. Within the last year. like a month ago, I think two months yeah. ago, I found this thing, which, you know, I related to a lot, I, you know, we're making our way through it. So we're only discussing one chapter at a time, but, um, I, I really found it kind of shocking some mm -hmm. of the stuff, um, you know, like I'm in my fifties and, and just now reading this is kind of mind blowing, but, uh, one thing that I first highlighted, which kind of blew me away, especially uh, in relation to my own life, because as a teenager, I ended up in juvenile hall. Um, but this line, and Louise, I don't know if this jumped out at you. Mm -hmm. As of the 1985 statistics, I mean, this book, by the way, was written in the early 90s. So I'm right. sure there's been more research. Updated. But yeah, but um, although adoptees at that time comprised two to 3% of the population of this country, they represented 30 to 40% of the individuals found in residential treatment centers, juvenile hall, and special schools. They had demonstrated a high incidence of juvenile delinquency, sexual promiscuity, and running away from home. They have had more difficulty in school, both academically and socially, than their non-adopted peers. The adoptees referred for treatment had relatively consistent symptoms, which are characterized as impulsive, provocative, aggressive, and antisocial. I, I, that blew me away, actually. It really, I was like, wow. I, and I didn't have that experience, and, but at the same time, I had a lot of rebellion that wasn't really typical for my family. And it just, I was like, okay, I've known a lot of adopted people. This fits a lot of scenarios I've seen. And just two percent of the population and they take up 30% of people going through that. That's it, like, it really is mind blowing 30 to 40%. Yeah. That's very high. And that's then. So I, I wonder now, and I wonder now if it's changed now that adoptions changed because adoptions become more open, more. Um, I wonder, you know, we'll have different experts on how maybe it's shifting because when you and I were adopted, it was very like, closed adoption and, and secretive and secretive shame, and a lot of shame. You didn't really talk about much. You don't, no one really brought it up too much. It was very like, oh, that's just what that is, but it was how lucky you were that you were yes. adopted or, you know, all of that stuff. Um, yes. I mean, I, I guess shame I meant for the, for the birth mothers. Oh, know. complete yeah. shame. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much uh, hiding they couldn't talk about, you know, what, and they've done a great thing for a child if they weren't able to raise the child. And yet it's like, oh my God, you've done, that. you know what I mean? This horrible, there's so much that goes with, it. and I wonder now with more open adoptions and as people like have, uh, you know, they're maybe involved with their, the birth mother and things, if that changes a little, it's interesting to think about. Um, I think, you know, what this book is really highlighting is that no matter how great it was for any kid that was adopted and raised, it's still that primal wound of separation yeah. from, from the mother. It uh, is because infants obviously know more than they were ever given credit for. And we know that now. Yes. Uh, so they, you know, memories and like spending nine months with that, getting used to that voice and bonding and so that's, I think, more the point of this book, no matter how great your life was, there's still that wound, you know, there's, um, I, I feel like 
most adopted people I know, and I know with you and with me, because we know each other, we've had hours of discussion of <laughs> this sitting on our ice cream truck is that, um, there, there was always a sense of self-soothing or like you, you had to take care of yourself and like pushing people away. Mm -hmm. And I had a great family experience yet. I was still very much like back off, push away, self-soothing. Like I, you know, like very inward in that way. Yeah. And, like now that you're saying that I'm remembering mm -hmm. weird little habits I had for self-soothing of, you know, uh, and stress, like my hair, you know, and I still <laughs> play with my hair and, and it, it, it's, it is interesting and walking. I do rocking. I rock. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, uh, you know, move my leg. Like I always have a piece. I, another weird habit I have is typing <laughs> on my legs. Like, oh yeah, really I've seen quietly. you quietly. <laughs> <laughs> you're also writing. Cause you're a writer. You're just... Yeah. <laughs> No, my mom used to say that I would do this rocking thing, like with my butt in the air, like this, like my own rocking thing. And she always just thought it was cute. I mean, she wasn't really, you know, my mother adopted me, but she wasn't given any classes about. They didn't do anything. Anything. I mean, like, just, here's a baby. And yeah, here you go. Go home with your child. And they already had my brother. So of course she was a good mother, knew what to do, but she said I would do things differently for sure like rock in my crib in this weird way and then not want to be touched or held very long. My grandmother used to call me Nuff in UFF because they'd run and hug me. They couldn't wait to see me in St. Louis. I get off the plane. I still remember it. In fact, like running into, and then as soon as they'd hug me too, I got Nuff. <laughs> Nuff. <laughs> but it's not just the personality thing. It really was like a, a thing. Yeah. And other adoptive people I know have this thing. I don't know what that, how to translate that, but it's a thing. You and I both have it. We have it that. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, what else did I highlight here? It is a good book. Anybody who's adopted should read it just to like, you know, going through it. it it's extensive to get through each chapter is like, you really look at it and read it. It's not just a quick read. I know. And I, I have highlighted so many things. Um, I, this also struck out at me, the, these two, uh, behavior specialists wrote, there's a, there's been a striking consistency of behavior problems among adoptees, whether the family is functional or dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And here's that line, you know, babies know more than they're supposed to know minutes after birth, a baby can pick out his mother's face, which he has never seen from a gallery of photos. The newly discovered wow. truth is that newborn babies have all their senses and make use of them just of the, as the rest of us do. Their cries of pain are authentic. Babies are not unfeeling. It is we who've been unfeeling. Isn't that babies, crazy? It's crazy. If babies remember birth, then they also remember what happened right after birth, which is that their mother, the person to whom they were connected and whom they expected to welcome them into the world was suddenly missing. How does this experience mm -hmm. impact the emotions and senses of the newborn baby? I mean, wow. I think about this with, with adoption and with people who have lost their mother in the delivery process too. Yeah. It's yeah. Gotta be the same, same, same thing. Same thing. The yeah. cut of that. Yeah. Wow. Same that's, thing. that's so big. Uh, I mean, and here, this is, and this is that core thing that, you know, I think, and let, you know, it takes a lot of work and self-awareness to, to get through this, but um, despite the continuity of relationship, which adoption provides adopted children experience themselves as unwanted, are unable to trust the adoptive relationship as being permanent and often dis demonstrate emotional disturbance and, and behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this trust, and this is what we'll get into when we talk about our stories, um, mm -hmm. which is where the difference being, you know, cause I had more than one abandonment. Um, yes. so, you know, uh, Let's we were see. talking about that this morning at my house with you and <laughs> you're saying it because it's almost like sliding doors. You go this way, you go that way, but then you add on other layers and it gets really complicated. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think the mistrust things always there, even in the best of circumstances, you think someone's going to leave you. I mean, I have trust issues forever that I work on. We're in our fifties and I'm finally like, Oh, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. <laughs> how long it's taken. I know. Out. Just, it's hmm. an ever evolving process. I yes. guess. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. 
Are there more things? I mean, I, I highlighted so much. Uh, let's see. Let's get to the really. By the way, our podcast will also be available for viewing if you'd like to see our closets. Yes. <laughs> We're going to see Sarah in her closet. <laughs> and you can see us shifting around in discomfort as we adjust our pillows and more, more yoga. Again, we're in our fifties and sitting in the closet. <laughs> more, more yoga is needed. We're the only people yeah. I know that have gone back into the closet to come up. <laughs> but well, it here's, works. A, here's something that I wanted to ask you about that I yeah. found interesting because I had never Every September when my birthday, like September is one of my least favorite months. And I always thought it was, oh, you know, maybe because of going back to school or this or that. But now then I read this and I, and I kind of related. uh, So the writer of the book has an adopted daughter. And so that's why she wrote the book. Uh, My daughter told me recently that each year, the three days between her birthday and the day we took her home are the three most difficult days of her life. She feels helpless, hopeless, empty, and alone. There seems to be a memory built into the psyche and cells, wow. an anniversary reaction, also often by the birth mother, which sends many adoptees into despair around their birthdays. That's so interesting. That Because you and I almost share a birthday, different yeah. years, but the same September. Yeah. And I always had a little bit of anxiety too. And I always thought school or we, um, you and I had a birthday party together once after we opened our, we had a gourmet ice cream truck in Los Angeles. After we opened that ice cream truck, we had a big birthday party together, which turned out to be really a fun night. And, um, I had such anxiety before it. And I used to get anxiety before all my little birthday parties as a kid. And part of that is social anxiety that I have in big groups. But it's also something weird, like, Oh, I don't want to celebrate my birthday. It's about my birthday. You know, if it, if it like for my wedding, I didn't have the same anxiety. It's an interesting. Yeah. I had never, it had never occurred to me. Interesting. Try to remember back. Um, I wonder if there is, there's just memory, like a strange, you know, like I get a little bit depressed. Right. Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. Me too. Me too. Yeah, that's really. I know there was a lot of zingers in that, but in the first chapter alone, I was like, wow, this is really <laughs> so many. And we don't need necessarily need to cover them all. I'm just good. We can wrap it up with this little thing that I highlighted. It's the end of the chapter, which the summary adoption considered by many to be merely a concept is in fact a traumatic experience for the adoptee. It begins with a separation from his, his that bothers me. Could they just say theirs? Uh, right. <laughs> his you. biological mother and ends with living with strangers. Um, most of his life, he may have denied or repressed his feelings about this experience, having had no sense that they would be acknowledged or validated. He may instead have been made to feel as if he should be grateful for this monumental mm-hmm. manipulation of his destiny. Somewhere within, however, he does have feelings about this traumatic experience and having these feelings does not mean that he's abnormal, sick or, sick or crazy. It means that he is wounded as a result of having suffered a devastating loss and that his feelings about this are legitimate and need to be acknowledged rather than ignored or challenged. So. That is, um, that's huge. First of all, you're right. The he thing, because that's just the 1980s. Yeah. But, no, that's uh, actually, I think this book was yeah. the 90s, but yeah. Yeah. The 90s, but it's more like the he, but, um, I feel there was a lot of guilt. Like if I felt like I was, and I definitely felt grateful. I mean, cause you do feel grateful. You love your family and you're, everyone's grateful for their family and you love your parents and, you know, but you had, I had a lot of, um, guilt if I questioned it or if I, was feeling, I felt guilty that I couldn't bring that up. You know what I mean? Like, it was like, I was supposed to, I feel really bad if it was bad that I was feeling bad about it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Or if I, or if I'd say, you know, and I had a brother who wasn't adopted and I would look at him and be like, oh, he's just like my parents. And so I, I asked things that I'd be made to feel kind no one really purposely made me feel bad about it. Of course. Cause they want you to feel loved. Oh, you're so loved and you're wanted, but sometimes you need a real answer. Or like a real validation of like, you know, I don't look like these people are. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone's... I don't remember even talking about it when, I mean, I remember being told, but I don't yes. remember. Uh, but when we get into your story next week, because yeah. I know you had some yeah, you know, guilt around curiosity or anything. Yeah. Maybe. Guilt. Um, yeah. Which, which no know. one really put on me, but guilt is. And it comes with that end of that chapter that really struck me that last, like, there's a huge thing and you're, you're just supposed to be grateful and just be yeah. like, grateful. 
and go along, but you know, there's things. Yeah, totally. <laughs> You're a baby. You have no control over any of this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this leads us into, we are going to talk about Sarah (laughs) (laughs) and we don't have five hours because she has a fascinating story. Actually, Sarah is a very interesting, awesome person who I love very much. And we've been through a ton together. And I just think your story is amazing who you've become, who you are, where you've been, your journey. So starting with that, what is your story about adoption, Sarah? making of Sarah? I was, of course, what I know now, I didn't know when I was younger. So I'll start with what I do know is that uh, my birth mother, Tilda, um, and my birth father went to, were in college together. And they broke up, I think, before she knew she was pregnant. Um, and I know he got drafted into Vietnam. Um, so when she did find out she was pregnant, she was unable to reach him. Mm -hmm. Um, and she hid her pregnancy from her own parents. Uh, now she too was adopted. Um, wow. So she hid her pregnancy. And when she was nine months pregnant, um, got on a plane with her mother, um, her adopted mother to go from JFK to St. Louis to go to nursing school. And on the flight, on the ascent from JFK, like 15 minutes into the ascent, her water broke. So she was in labor for oh, the whole flight, God. um, landed in St. Louis, like, and did had still didn't tell her mother she was pregnant. She'd oh, only gained seven pounds in her pregnancy. So she wasn't clearly wasn't showing, um, which accounts for my low birth rate of like six pounds or something Um, lands in St. Louis. And, you know, the nurse was like, you know, you're having a baby. And she's like, don't tell my mom. And it was like, yeah, right. I think so. she was 18. And um, then her mom said, you are not keeping this baby. And I, I don't remember if she was, I'm sure she had to nurse me. Cause when you're born, you have to nurse immediately, but, uh, you know, they took me away right away. And then yeah. I went into foster care with a foster woman for six weeks. And then wow. my parents got me. Um, so from, from, you know, I have a baby, I had a baby book. I lost it or it got stolen at one point along the way, but, but I was very wanted and, um, and, you know, happy first few years of my life grew up so born in St. Louis and went to a town called Jefferson city. And, um, <laughs> and then when I was like two and a half, they adopted my brother, Todd. And then when Todd was five months old, my mom got pregnant with twins. So oh. there was just utter chaos from them, but you know, who remembers those early days? I don't really remember much. Um, but the turning point I think was, I mean, obviously was when my parents got divorced and my mom left, uh, as opposed to my dad. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, it was overwhelming for my dad. Um, and I, he just kind of, you know, checked out. Uh, yeah. uh, overwhelmed. He was 30 years old with four kids under the age of, you know, four and under. Um, wow. And then my mom was in another town and she went back to school. She was like 30 miles away and went back to school, went back to college. And, um, we'd see her like every other weekend we'd split up, you know, these are all hazy, hazy, oh, hazy yeah. memories and times, um, uh, that, so, and then my dad got remarried when I was 12. So for, from, I feel like I've blocked a lot out. Oh but, yeah. Um, how old were so, you? How old were you before he remarried when your mom first left? My mom left at seven. Uh-huh. Um, not, not a hundred percent voluntary. There's a lot of murky right. stuff that, right. you know, <laughs> uh, about what happened with the divorce and a lot I'm of, sure. it, just a lot of pain, um, all mm-hmm. around lots, lots and lots of pain for everybody. Um, so she left when I was seven and he got remarried when I was 12. Uh, yeah, that's, and those are stressful years in there. 
Very, very. Like I remember having to, you know, I need needed a bra and I yeah. like, I felt like I needed a bra. I wanted a bra. Right. I was <laughs> like course. 11 or 12 or something. And my dad was like, you don't need a bra. And so, <laughs> right. Didn't we all? And then you're like, yes, I want one. It's a big thing. You get made fun of at school if you don't have a bra. Oh, and it was just like little, oh, little, you know, little things that just all these things that just added up to my self-worth issues that, that yeah. trailed me for my entire life, you know, that, because that, because you start off like starting off life with this, okay, I was given up for adoption, that, that initial abandonment, right? Then, yeah. then my adopted mom leaves and my dad checks out and then like all these little things of like, well, I can't get a bra, you know, just right more and more going into this shell and then you know having these and protecting your brothers who are all younger I mean yeah yeah you're a nurturer I'm sure you're trying to protect them too yeah and they were They're so going... little you know oh yeah um and then my yeah then then my dad got remarried um uh oh and my mom moved to Miami uh at she got remarried and moved to Miami I think I must have been nine maybe uh, I just yeah. can't remember 10. Uh, so we, go, you know, like I'd go down for a summer or my brother would go down for a summer or brothers. Um, you know, but that was like, we'd see her less and less. Yeah. Um, so it was just always, I think I ha walked around with this sense of longing and loneliness for my whole childhood. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. just, you know, uh, yeah. And that was when I discovered music. That was, you know, I'd walk around, I had a little blue transistor radio and a and <laughs> white, uh, you know, back then it was just oh, like yeah. one earplug, not, not <laughs> right. two. Like, I don't know why they couldn't figure out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I remember you'd hang it out of your ear and then you had the, ra the radio. Yeah. Oh and, my gosh. and I'd just, you know, escape into music at an early age. And it's you're like, still so into music. That's I, your I probably healing can, place. Yeah. My healing place. I probably, uh, you know, have the lyrics to, you know, hundreds of bad soft rock from the seventies, you know, <laughs> stored. <laughs> wow. That's big. It's, it's the, the move to Miami is big too. Having your mom actually move mm -hmm. really far. I mean, cause this is your mom and you're close to your mom now. Yeah. And you're, so it's, uh, that's too, I feel like you were, you've had abandonment several times along the way. Very so, much, which led to a lot of, oh my God, acting out and, uh, trouble and problems and, you know, ultimately finally running away when I was 15, you know, my dad got remarried, like I said. Yeah. Um, and she had three kids. So I have three step siblings. Um, they, who, you're, who, you know, and you're part of their lives now. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Um, but they didn't, int they basically introduced us and then like, I don't even know how many, like a few months later got married, like, and like everyone hello, moves in together. New, we all moved in together with really no getting to know each other. I had a dog who suddenly had, you know, ran away, um, uh, which, what? I, mm. Mm, mm, yeah, uh, <laughs> there were just so many, so many. So, and then go also going through, so you're putting all these kids together who are basically all going through hormones, mm -hmm. uh, who don't know each other. It was just, a, you know, a, a recipe. And no, and no one is back then counseled on any of this. No one's None. getting therapy or like, let's have the kids meet and do these special out. I mean, it's just like, here you go. Here's your siblings deal with it. Get along. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in love with this woman. I mean, yeah. I think we did go to one or a few, uh, group therapy sessions of which I don't remember the details, but, uh, like all of us, and you know, just yeah. there's a, in the wedding picture, my one <laughs> stepsister had been crying, you know, just, oh. <laughs> it's a, it's a, <laughs> but it's not that I don't want to get into all of their yeah. stuff. It's not yeah. fair. Like, but I just want to speak of my experience. Um, of course. but, uh, so yeah, I, I started getting into, into, into trouble. I just, was unhappy and depressed and acted out and, 
finally ran away. And, um, at that point, my mom said, come to Florida. And then, uh, um, I went to Florida and, and dark days ahead for quite a few years, like, uh, which I know I'm happy to get into. Um, but, uh, I think, or you can probe further. I would, I would, I'll wrap it up though. I went to Florida, um, and then, you know, finally got my, my act together somewhere mm-hmm. around like the time I was 20. And then I moved to New York and New York was kind of life-changing for me. Those and, were the, what, the big well, like Sarah years. Yeah. What was interesting, own. what, what, you know, at the time I didn't know that I was from New York biologically, genetically from oh, so crazy. the East coast. Yeah. Um, and it was the first time when I landed in New York, I'm like, I'm home, you know, I had oh, that's n- never felt home before, but, and from an early age, I wanted to live in New York. I just remember, you know, being young and fantasizing about New York and watching these old detective shows and, you know, oh, yeah. the city so much and just, Oh God, I loved it. So from the first time I landed there, I was like, I'm home. And, you know, as it turns out and weirdly enough. So at one point, once I did meet Tilda, I found mm-hmm. out that in, we were living across the street from each other in New York in 1990. Why she uh, was alive. Oh yeah. Oh, that's amazing. You were drawn to that area. Yeah. I mean, I, I really believe in those things because you kind of are, I think of you as a New Yorker in a weird way, even though I've yeah. only known California, isn't that funny? And now you're in the Midwest, but I, I've really only known you as a Los Angeles, Los Angelinos, but I think of you as like a New Yorker. Oh, Sarah is a New Yorker. You know what I mean? Like, it's so interesting. I think of myself that way too. Um, And how did you meet? And when you met Tilda, how was that? Like when you did meet your biological mom, how was that whole? Well, so I, I, I decided to look, I'd always been curious. Yeah, obviously. Um, But it was when I was pregnant with Becker, my son mm-hmm. Becker, who is 23. Um, he, uh, I just wanted, kind of wanted to know like the medical stuff and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, and since I was adopted in Missouri, it was a closed adoption. I was adopted right. through the Lutheran Children's Services. So I go get in touch with the adoption agency and they had these strict rules that unless both parents want to meet you, you can't meet either oh, one of them. So right. it, it took a few months and then finally they got back to me and they said, well, we, it was a dead end with your birth father and your birth mother really wants to meet you. So they, you know, we got together on the yeah. phone, we talked on the phone and we had like two or three conversations and I, you know, for her, because she had given birth to me, she was so, you know, like she oh, loved me, whereas right. I didn't, feel that yet or just and and you know in retrospect I have a lot of regret uh because yeah. she ended up dying in 2009 but I have regret that I wasn't more open-hearted that I was defensive about oh, completely meeting and you know keeping my distance and being loyal and you know oh, now yeah. I know you can separate the two and it, you know one has nothing to do with the other but at the time I just had these defenses up um having said that we still got really close and um I have siblings through her. Um, then I still talk to them and, uh, like they're, I feel like they're my sisters and I'm close. And, um, and did she, ra- she raised them? Yes. So yeah. I was, she gave birth to me and then within two years, she gave birth to, uh, my, my brother, Stefan, who's no longer, he died in the year 2000. Then so that was a different dad. And then a few years after that, she gave birth to my brother, Alecky, again, a different dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she got married and she had two daughters, Annie and Noel and mm-hmm. Marie and Noel. Um, Noel is exactly 20 years younger than I am. Um, oh. and so, yeah, so, you know, that's a whole interwoven story. Oh yeah. Um, and then when I, so we had talked a few times on the phone and then she called now, mind you, I have a new baby. He's like, Becker is like seven, eight months old at the time. And, Which is um, another thing I'll ask you about. Yes. Uh, so he, uh, so she calls and she says, um, I, I've got, I got train tickets for me and the girls. We're oh. coming to stay with you for three weeks. Oh God. And I was like, <laughs> 
<gasps> oh my god and, and i was like, by the way like, anybody coming for three weeks is anybody, like that yeah and now you've got i'd be like panic i think i'd almost have i'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> i was like There's oh my so god. many layers into this i'd be like ah oh. I know this whole story because then you meeting my, then finding my birth father's family through ancestry is a whole oh. other story that oh, yeah. I don't know the, how we have time for that. But, um, anyway, they, they, we were living in a loft, you know, <laughs> in Venice day with the baby, David and I, you know, were what we were our David Becker's dad, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so they, it, I, I wrote a whole short story about this. I wrote a screenplay about this. Uh, you know, it was just three weeks of, of, I mean, just fascination, <laughs> craziness and, and, uh, two teenage girls and Annie went and got her tongue pierced on Venice beach as a 15 year old. And like, <laughs> And the crazy thing is, is you're dealing with having your own baby. I know that was having my own baby huge yeah. for me being an adopted person, having my own flesh and blood child. So how, when you had Becker, what was, what's that experience? And what, you know what I mean? What did that do for you? Like, you know, the, if he heard me say this, I know it would feel a lot of, it would feel strange and pressure to him, but mm -hmm. you know, since we came, started thinking about doing this podcast, I've really kind of been digging and thinking about reflecting, I guess, on my own mm -hmm. life, and, you know, I'm not in a relationship and, um, and I feel like, you know, he was the first, I know I, I, I attached to my mom and my parents and stuff, but mm -hmm. Becker was the first real bond mm -hmm. that I had. And that I, you know, that maybe I, you know, like really, really, oh yeah bonded and connected to that uh and you still are you're both very close i mean you yeah, have a very bond. very close to him yeah. yeah um luckily he doesn't have the same wounds i have you know so he yeah. he's able to kind of have a different a little life. plug for becker he's a wonderful kid we love him <laughs> <laughs> so yes. you've done a good job there likewise friend thank you um <laughs> Yeah. So that was my experience meeting. And then, then, you know, I would no, it, it just makes me cry. Like thinking about you having Becker and like this, cause I can feel it cause I've been through it. So it's like this, I'm just like blown away. And then you have your biological mom and siblings staying with you. That would be <laughs> <laughs> like really wild. But, you know, I did, I so connected with my, with my sisters too, like, and Noel, would come out and see me a lot and like I came and stay, you know, very close. Um, uh, and then Tilda died in 2009, which was so sad. That's and Becker sad. and I went to Santa Fe to say goodbye. And, um, you know, and still, I didn't know who my, I knew my birth father's name, but that, that, and where he was from and mm -hmm. that was it. So in, in 2010, um, I got on Ancestry and, you know, as I always did, plugged his name in. This is pre-DNA testing. Oh, yeah. Um, and I saw. Oh, pre-DNA. That's interesting. Pre-DNA testing. Yep. So I saw a, uh, a girl's name looking, you know, that like had him in her tree. And it said that she was born in like 1986 or something. And I went, I bet this is a daughter of my birth father. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, is seeking answers as well. So I sent her a message and within half an hour, she got back to me and wow. she said, yes, he was my father. My mom was his second wife. I, uh, I'm looking for the family and blah, blah, blah. So it all I did a quick Google search. She gave me some more information. I did a mm -hmm. quick Google search and or ancestry search or something and found my first cousin through you know, and then I got all the information finally about yeah. my birth father. Um, you know, he had died. So he lived oh. in Florida as did I, you know, there's all these, that's kind of weird. Things. Too. He had, um, had his own wounds and battle because he went to Vietnam yeah. and he got a purple heart because he saw like, I think his whole platoon died in front of him. Then he was in, in, wounded wow. for a long time. Then he, you know, went back. So he was from New Hampshire. So again, you know, all this East mm -hmm. coast stuff, New York, New Hampshire. Um, 
And he didn't know you were in no, existence. He did not know I was born wow. or anything. So he died in the like 86 or 87, mm. somewhere around there when I was in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, I have cousins and all that stuff through him. And then, um, but his first marriage um, ended in like, he ended up kind of losing it. I think that PTSD caught up with oh, him yeah. from what, what they told me. And then he, and he had, he had two kids in his first marriage. So I have two, three siblings total through him, two through his first marriage and one through his second. Um, you have a lot of siblings, a lot. <laughs> I have a lot of siblings. Um, and so he then ended up like he, you know, died, but so his first kids, I have a brother named Michael, mm -hmm. who's a few years younger than I am. And then a sister named Kristen. And I, you know, like originally I had really wanted to go exploring like this whole nature versus nurture. Yes. Um, it's kind of how this started. Yeah. Like what, and this, this family in particular, because also since Tilda was adopted, that was a big dead end for me for a long, long time. And then, you know, until I did the ancestry DNA a few mm -hmm. years ago, um, and had my sister Annie do it too. So I could find out who all, like, there were people that, I, that are, I've through, met yeah. through my birth father, but then this dead end of Tilda's family. Yeah. Because she's adopted, right? Cause she was adopted. So that was always the missing piece that I thought, well, I'll probably just never be able to find out. But when my sister Annie got on there, then we had some matches in common. Um, so fast, but, but still nobody knew anything until was it like three years ago? I think it was, I got a message from somebody on Amazon saying you come up as a, as a, as a cousin. And, um, and I wrote back and said, well, that's kind of a area I know nothing about. I was, I was adopted as was my birth mother. And so this woman says, so was I. And, you know, <laughs> I, and she had found her birth mother. So it turns out, um, Tilda's mother, my grandmother uh -huh. was her aunt. Uh, and oh. so I found all the answers to that side of the family. Um, That's so crazy. And out of my grandmother came from a family of six in Rochester, New York, uh -huh, New out York. of those six, I think four of them gave up kids for adoption. Wow. That's which, a, the whole story there. I know, which is, and part of it is the era because you can't, I mean, and that was the forties. Yes. I mean, God, you, so you my grandmother, yeah. daughter out of wedlock and son out of wedlock back then, you know, God forbid you still had sex. Yeah. Well, and I think, <laughs> I think my grandmother, you know, was at a party and hooked up with someone and gave birth to me. I'm like, <laughs> I guess I come from a long line of party girls, <laughs> <laughs> which is why I love you. <laughs> I mean, all this is so fascinating because, uh, I mean, we're going to obviously do a whole thing where we bring in the DNA part and the ancestry part. Yeah. That's interesting too. And just, I mean, you have such a big line of family that's like really affected your adoption affects so many others. I mm -hmm. mean, and you've actually closed loops for other people doing your own investigations. By the way, Sarah is a huge investigator. This is a side <laughs> note, <laughs> as am I, because <laughs> we had actually thought about opening the detective agency. We love to investigate <laughs> and we'd be good at it. By the way, if anyone wants to hire us, we'd be very good at it because both of us are huge investigators. We like can go down rabbit holes for hours. Yes. Not, not Q, <laughs> not Q though. <laughs> no, not Q. <laughs> we keep it in, in the thinking realm, but, um, yeah. but it's interesting because your investigations have probably helped others find things they wanted to know and how, and I think there's a real thing about finding your family and just, you know, and, and you're not disloyal to your parents. That's just no, the whole, that's the, bringing it back to the whole. Yeah. Luckily they were super supportive about it. Uh, oh, these glasses are hurting. um, they were, they were super supportive about it. I'm, you know, I'm sure there was some feelings, uh, Oh yeah, but now there's a lot of unspoken feelings people. Yeah, you know, keep inside, and because they want you to have your journey, but people have their own, you know, their own pain and their own. Because they love you, and they do love you, your parents. It's a very um, that's a complicated. <laughs> 
it's interesting how it affected you and you didn't really know until your adult years why i mean this is how what i found for me too that it takes into your 40s and 50s to really go wait a second this is all very you just you know i don't know that i ever put the adoption thing on a lot of my issues i guess that's what i'm trying to say yeah until you really I think start I did on an intellectual you did a basis, yeah. you know, like I went to my first therapy appointment at 20, you know, I knew That's something I was good. like, you know, and I'd been on my own since I was 17 at my first apartment. I mean, that's Crazy. a whole, like that, the whole, like that there, there were five years in Miami where, you know, I call them the dark days. Uh, that, that would be an, <laughs> I could write a whole book on just those five years and the, Oh my God. Um, but the learning years too, though. I mean, uh, you learn everything. You're the most street smart person I know. So it's like, those are the years you learned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many deep layers that we can go into it, but, uh, but, and, you know, as we go on, we'll, you know, yes. Oh, there'll be more. I mean, be more. I love your story. I think the thing that I think is most beautiful about your story is you become this amazing mother and you're so bonded with your own child. And I think you appreciate it more than anybody I know. You know what I mean? That's kind of really, that's a nice yeah. thing to say. Yeah, you really do. You, you love being a mom and since I've known you, it makes me cry. Oh, <laughs> Becker's mom and Becker, you're a lucky guy, you know, because it's a, um, another, boy, that was a, a t talk about being unprepared for yeah. the empty nest. I mean, uh, there's a whole, the, that may uh, be our next podcast. Yeah. Cause it, it's just been <laughs> the primal you know. second. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. It's like, wait, come back. Well, I wasn't ready for this. I didn't yeah. see beyond this. I didn't see beyond it. That's what it was. Right. I didn't see beyond. That's him a good way to say it. Yeah. yeah. Now. Yeah. He, no, me neither. That's interesting. No. Oh. Well, we're, here we are. Uh, we're we're so podcasting have, because of it. <laughs> I know. And we don't know how long we've gone, do we? Um, I do not know how long we've gone, but it's been a wonderful time. I think it, we're it right has, on time. Yeah, it has been a wonderful time. We can always have part two for our stories too. If we didn't you know, or we can, we can, there are no rules. Yeah, here. There there's no rules. rules. Yeah. And we're going to follow up with, um, next week we'll do my story. And yep. then we are going to have all, if, when you hear our podcast, if you have someone you say has to be on our show, please let us know because we, yes, definitely. We'd love to have not just we would like to have other adopted people, obviously, that they're going to be on our show. We like to have experts in the field of adoption that work maybe in this field, anybody in the DNA field. Um, also, also, yeah, people who gave up. Yes. Their, you know, I want to hear that perspective. And, and that's then, harder yeah. to find someone who wants to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and siblings. Yes. Siblings. I think about my own brother. What would that mean for him? And and, and yeah. adopted parents who adopted kids and what they saw, particularly, I guess, people have also have biological kids, like how, what difference yes. they might've seen or. Yes. I know. I'd love to interview my parents and they're both obviously passed away, but it's like, what are the differences you, now that you have perspective, what are the differences you see with biological, not biological? Because there's, there's so many stories out there and people with open adoptions now, how is that? Yeah. You know, like there's those, just so many roads that we can go down. Oh, there's it. so many roads. So, so interesting. <laughs> so this is our podcast, the making Yay. of me, right? The making of me. <laughs> exactly. And so, <laughs> <laughs> we're new at this, everyone. <laughs> be patient, <laughs> be patient, but I think it's going to be great. And, um, I've, I've enjoyed this time. This has been really me special. too. I love it. We could, you me too. I, we, we just could talk forever always. We, <laughs> we and like, it that. just leads down different roads and paths. And I hope yeah. my story was clear and uh, there's much it was more. Wonderful. It was I wonderful. It was very clear. Okay. And, uh, and we look forward to it. Sarah and I spent hours on an ice cream truck in Los Angeles, going around to private events and catering and, movie sets and breaking into things we weren't supposed to be at by yeah. line and saying, no, oh, we paid, we're here. <laughs> and breaking things. down. Like we yes. remember that we breaking drove down. with no brakes. Uh, down Laurel Canyon. 
<laughs> Laurel anybody Canyon. that knows Los Angeles, the fact that we drove down Laurel Canyon with no brakes and we're still alive, you should be impressed. My son still gets mad at me about our drive to Palmdale. Oh, yes. <laughs> He's like, why would you have? I, I wish I, I'm, why would you have ever done it? And then recently, he, too. he and my husband have both told me recently how they were terrified when they'd ride with me to an event. <laughs> Back sitting, with, <laughs> sitting with the open door, Jack's like, you know, it was really unsafe. I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> we had no fear. I don't know. We were just so fearless, but we, the thing that we enjoyed the most, I think out of that whole experience, besides building a business and all that branding and hard work was really talking to people. Yeah, it's been hours. It was almost like we were therapists, like Lucy with her little stand. Yes, exactly. Oh, come to the ice cream window <laughs> and stand there for like three hours. We'd know everything about and we would dig it out. Oh, really? Tell us more. Why? <laughs> Why do you think your wife's not speaking to you? You know, like <laughs> so I think I think we're on to something with our podcast here. I think so too. We're the dynamic duo, we the are. dream team, the dream team more than the scream team, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks yeah. for, for tuning in and stay with us. Stay with us. And thank you, Sarah. Interesting things. And thank you, Louise. I love thank you. you. I love you too. <laughs> okay. See you next time. See you next time.